May the 26th, 2013, a fatal accident took place in the deepest cave in Greece. George Terizakis, a young and passionate diver, descended its depth alongside his team on a Sunday afternoon. As the dive concluded, everything appeared to be in order, but for unknown reasons, George lost consciousness, leaving his team, family and friends searching for answers as they grappled with the reality of the situation. This is the 2013 Sinew Cave disaster. Born in Athens, Greece, George Terezakis exuded a remarkable, open-hearted nature, always smiling, giving and sharing. Emerging as a recent addition to the Selas Diving Club, his enthusiasm and motivation set him apart. As he was quite young at 25, they all believed he would evolve into a great cave diver. He loved diving caves and the sea and was extremely happy diving his rebreather that opened up new horizons for him. Five kilometers away from the town of Candela, in a height of 700 meters surrounded by the Arcadian Mountains and at the end of a beautiful valley of cultivable areas, there are the springs of Cincy. Since 1990, these springs have become a site that draw the attention of cave divers and speediologists from Greece and abroad. There have been many important expeditions with the assistance of the Helianalic Speediological and Exploration Club and its divers with the milestone to be the one of 2009 when the divers reached the incredible depth of 153 meters, making this cave the most deep in Greece and one of the deepest in Europe. However, the most important expedition until today is the one of 2015, called Cincy Cave Expedition, when the diver Fontads Peter Nilis reached 186 meters, breaking the record of Georgos Trevelas, stating that the cave is even deeper. The habitat that can be seen in the video had been set up by the Spelio Club in the previous expeditions and was used during the 2015 expedition. The water in the cave is fresh and the temperature is between 10 to 12 degrees. Generally, the visibility is very good, but it differentiates depending on the season and most probably on the rainfalls that change and affect the power with which the water flows out. An important detail of the morphology of the cave is its rambling area. The rocky surfaces have been carved thousands of years by the strength of the waters that gradually create the curved surface. On May the 26th, 2013, the Selas Diving Club arrived at the Stensi Cave. The cave is deep and these dives were all part of the preparation for further exploration as part of the wider Shinji Cave Research Project. George played a vital role as a support diver amongst a team of four, all equipped with Megalodon rebreathers. George was using an axial scrubber for the dive. The scrubber sits in the canister and needs to be pulled up with a finger in order to retrieve it, which is a small inconvenience for divers. To make this process easier, George attached two small cords, one at each end as seen by these pictures. The length of the knobs of the cord was exactly the right length to sit on the canister two O-rings. While inserting the scrubber, the line went inside the hole and stuck between the scrubber and the head O-ring. The line was thin enough so that the knots could squeeze in. Had it been a little thicker, it would not allow the head to sit in. The knobs were sitting exactly on the two O-rings, creating a small gap allowing carbon dioxide bypass. The bypass was very small but enough to have slowly and cumulatively increasing CO2 levels. No pre-dive test or checklist can detect this problem, as a simple pre-breathing will not be long enough to notice problems. Shortly after one o'clock on Sunday afternoon, the four cave divers began diving. They split into two groups. George with the second of his group dived to a depth of around 60 to 62 meters and made a penetration in a cave corridor for about 400 meters. At the same time, the other group stayed at a depth of 10 to 12 meters. The dive lasted almost two hours. 40 minutes into the dive, carbon dioxide levels reached a very high level and George suddenly became unconscious. The carbon dioxide levels increased slowly, so George did not become aware of the problem 
until it was too late. Hypercapnia in diving refers to a condition where there is an excessive buildup of carbon dioxide in the body. When the body doesn't effectively eliminate the accumulating CO2, it can lead to symptoms like dizziness, confusion, headache, increased breathing rate, and potentially more serious effects like unconsciousness or even death. At the time of the accident, George was at a depth of 14 to 15 meters, decompressing from the dive. He was spotted within seconds and the closest team member got to him immediately. He was completely unresponsive and not breathing. As this happened just below the habitat, they moved him into the habitat and tried to revive him with no success. Realizing that they were not succeeding, they left him there and came out of the cave looking for help. Ultimately, after two attempts, the lifeless body of George was located at dawn on a Monday. These efforts were carried out by teams of three skilled cave divers, determined to bring closure to the ordeal. George's funeral solemnized his memory at Kai Sariani Cemetery the following Tuesday, May the 28th, 2013. Today, an annual memorial service in honor of George finds its place in the heart of the city, within the walls of the Church of St. George, situated in the courtyard of the Acropolis Museum. May he rest in peace. Located beneath the crystal clear waters of the Atlantic Ocean, at a depth of approximately 30 meters, and some 700 meters from the scenic coast of Palmar, lies Los Camarones Cave. Over the years, the cave has gone by different names, such as Palma Cave and Al Juanito. However, none of these names have endured quite like the Cave of Death. Deemed the most dangerous cave in Europe by many, the murky water fatally trapped two divers 45 years ago and buried two more nearly a decade later. This is the Los Camarones disasters. Francois de Roubaix was born on April the 3rd, 1939, a few weeks before the outbreak of the Second World War. His father, Paul de Roubaix, was an institutional film producer and his mother, Mimi Indele, painter and cartoonist. Francois was an average student whose favorite subject was drawing though he also began to develop a passion for music at 15, when his grandmother offered him her harmonica. He discovered a second passion, the sea. After his mother introduced him to underwater fishing during holidays in Toulon and St. Raphael, the de Rubu family bought a property in Corsica in the early 1950s that would serve as a place to unwind for Francois throughout his life. His professional musical career only spanned 10 years, from 1965 to 1975. During that period, he composed for commercials, TV series, shorts, and about 30 feature-length films. To break his intense pace of work and recharge his batteries, whenever he could, Francois practiced his other great passion, scuba diving. In the company of his friends, he discovered the seas and oceans of the globe. He brought back many photos from his travels, and had plans of publishing a book on night diving. Francois had a great relationship with Juan Jose Bentes Castilla, a 29-year-old diving champion hailing from the Canary Islands. Despite his experience, accredited with his titles as a diving champion of Spain and the Canary Islands and a national diving instructor, in 1971, he had moved to Los Cristianos, where he set up an immersion club. During those first years, he became acquainted with the local fauna as an underwater photographer and defender of these species. He always said that he would never work in an office, that he was a free being, and that the only thing he liked was nature and the sea. Francois arrived on November the 16th, 1975, with his partner Rosario and son Benjamin in the Canary Islands. Francois knew the cave in question, having been there several times to take photos for the book he was preparing. On November the 20th, he was accompanied by Juan for the night dive. Additionally, Francois's wife, son and a captain were part of the group. After a short boat ride 700 meters from the coast of Palmar, they anchored near the fish farms and prepared to descend. Francois and Juan geared up and swam down from the boat to a depth of 33 meters. The statue of Our Lady of Carmen 
stood tall at the bottom of the sea floor, said to bless all those who dived in the Tenerife Sea. Los Camarones Cave is considered to be one of the most treacherous caves among diving enthusiasts. Between 60 and 100 divers swim down every day, but they never enter the cave. Even though many of the dive shops frequently visit this site, most of them do not take divers inside. Even with a full cave certification, the dive shops hesitate to let divers into the cave because the dive masters are not cave trained and their resources are tied in guiding the main group outside of the cave. The cave seems very straightforward but should not be underestimated. Unlike most caves closer to the coast, Los Camarones has no air bubbles to breathe but its worst trap is hidden in the sediment that lies at the bottom, a time bomb as the sudden movement of any fish alerted by torches or improper flapping by divers causes a cloud of silt that destroys visibility for hours. Divers would be pushing it going even just 10 meters without a line. Once inside, it can be practically impossible to exit. According to testimony of those who have accessed its interior, the grotto is the closest thing to a death trap. It is recommended that divers who want to explore the cave completely need to plan for 30 minutes cave time, even though the distances are not that long. At that range, you can stay 30 minutes, no more, because to get out is much more demanding than other caves, explained the documentary photographer and publicist of the island seabed, Sergio Hanquit, who has visited Los Camarones on several occasions. The entrance of the cave is located at a depth of 33 meters and about four meters high but it gets shallower when divers penetrate further. In the cave, there are two main branches that are connected by a short tunnel. This tunnel can be quite low depending on how the sand has moved. The right-hand branch turns left and becomes very narrow at a depth of 24 meters, and then it turns back on itself in a U-shape. Occasionally, the local divers have left a guideline on either of the branches, but usually this line hangs off the ceiling and there is a risk of getting entangled with divers' valves. On the day of the dive, both Francois and Juan had been reckless as they had dived with no safety equipment. Before entering Los Camarones, Francois and Juan did not lay a guideline. Furthermore, their air tanks were only filled for a 30-minute dive duration and they did not have any spare tanks available in case of emergency. After taking a few pictures, including close-ups, they tried to find the exit of the cave, but the water had suddenly become turbid, preventing any visibility. The two men turned in circles, and without a line, it was impossible to find a way out. A leading theory regarding the cause of the silt-out suggests that a dormant giant stingray, disturbed by Francois and Juan, had been woken up and stirred up the sandy floor, causing a thick fog. In a statement in Benjamin Rue's biography, he goes on to say, I was with my mother on the diving boat that day. I was only six and a half months old, so I have no memory of it. But I sometimes imagine the Tenerife Bay, the shimmering sea, the late afternoon sun, and the captain saying to my mother, there is no more air in the canisters. They should have come back up. Help arrived that same evening. But the suspended sand inside the cave forced the Garda Civil's special group for underwater operations, in charge of the recovery, to postpone the operation. Therefore, they didn't fish up the two bodies until the following morning. Based on reports of GEAS rescue divers, bruises and scratches could be seen on Francois and Juan's bodies, which gives us a glimpse into the horror they must have experienced as they fought to get out of the cave. According to some accounts, Juan sacrificed himself by giving Francois his bottle to try and get out. Maria Elder, Juan José Bentes' widow, explained in a statement to Television Canaria that her husband would give his life for any student, but for Francois even more. And that, in her opinion, Juan went to the top. But when he looked back and saw Francois was not coming, he went back to the cave to get him out, and neither survived. Francois escalated the event internationally, especially in France, where his death caused a great stir. His passing sent shockwaves through the artistic community, 
as the visionary composer was hailed as a true pioneer of his era. His final resting place lays in the serene cemetery of Arona, nestled on a tranquil Spanish island amidst the vast Atlantic. Juan was buried in the Canaries, but the whereabouts are unknown. His friends spoke of him as a hero, a term used by several of those attending the tribute held at the Auditoria Infanta Leonor de los Cristianos on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of his death, in which the Councillor for Culture of Arona, Leopoldo Diaz Alda, presented a plaque to his family which was collected by his grandson. Nine years after the accident, on the 26th of April 1984, the Cuava de las Camarones made media headlines again. Two German divers, Henry Sarpentin, a 38-year-old instructor at a diving club in Playa de las Americas, and 17-year-old Jan Stenner, one of his students who was spending his holidays in Tenerife, were also caught in the deadly grotto when they took part in a dive around the cave with a dozen other divers. The dive was organized by a German diving club in Tenerife and included experienced divers as well as beginners like Jan Stenner. The group was excited to explore the mysterious cave, unaware of the tragic events that had taken place there almost a decade earlier. Several divers have pointed out the strange sensation they have experienced at the entrance of the cave, as if time suddenly stopped. After the dive was over, they noticed that one of the divers was missing. Henry Sarpentine, the instructor, became increasingly worried and decided to return to the cave in a desperate attempt to rescue his student, who is now identified as Jan Stenner. He swam back into the cave knowing that his oxygen reserves were low. Despite the danger, Henry continued his search for Jens, but unfortunately, neither him or Jens would return. The GEAS divers faced many challenges during the rescue operation due to the difficult conditions of the cave. The suspended sand made it hard for them to navigate, and the limited visibility added to the difficulty. As they searched for the missing divers, they were forced to postpone the operation for 24 hours due to the dangerous conditions, similarly to Juan and Francois's body recovery. They discovered the bodies of the two German divers along with a video camera and a lead belt. The footage from the camera was examined and provided valuable information for future diving expeditions in the cave but was never released to the public due to the wish of their family members. After the second accident, Los Camarones was classified as the most deadly underwater cave in Europe. The unique rock formations and the diverse marine life continue to attract hundreds of divers every year. However, the cave itself remained a no-go zone, with strict warnings in place against entering the deadly grotto. The local authorities have taken measures to ensure the safety of visitors such as setting up an underwater path with signs that guide divers around the perimeter of the cave. The area is also regularly monitored by diving instructors and safety experts. Members of the Mondo de Silanzo Association, a non-profit organization dedicated to the defense and protection of the marine environment, placed on January the 1st an iron cross measuring one meter high and weighing 80 kilos at the entrance of the cave in memory of the victims and to warn of the risk within. The lives lost in Los Camarones may be gone, but they are not forgotten. Chris and Chrissy Rouse were a father and son dive team of the early 1980s. Their passion for the sport fueled a dive that led them 240 feet deep into remote Atlantic waters. Many cautioned that their level of training might not be sufficient for such an advanced endeavor, but their yearning for fame and recognition proved to be stronger than their concerns about training. Unfortunately, it would seem that it was the Rouse's place in history to demonstrate what happens when overconfidence and ego blinds divers of their limitations. This is their story. The Rouse's had gotten into diving in the mid-1980s, back when the idea of a middle-class family in rural Pennsylvania owning a small airplane and taking long vacations every year wasn't entirely preposterous. They first tried the sport for reasons that seem almost quaint today. Life was just too predictable. 
both Chris and Chrissy longed to explore the world. They wanted to discover something new, to be somebody, to make a name for themselves. The Rouses had a complicated relationship. You see, Chris and Chrissy would bicker constantly, but did love each other and would almost solely dive with each other. But their relationship seemed to revolve around a pattern of trying to one-up the other. This created a slight tension between them, making their father-son bond more complex than it appeared at first glance. Despite this, they shared a massive passion for diving, so naturally they learned and progressed within the sport very fast. Going from open water divers to certified cave divers and tech divers within a few years. With less than 500 dives under their belts each, some would say that they were too inexperienced to be where they were within the sport. In 1991, a now retired longtime deep wreck diver named Bill Nagel, who led a team that recovered one of the Andrea Doria ship's bells, was the captain of the recreational deep dive boat Seeker out of New Jersey. Bill heard an intriguing tale from a friend and a local charter boat captain. Every time the captain took a group out to an area off the coast, all his clients called fish. The captain knew that this was no fluke and told Bill, there's something under there. Curiosity got the best of Bill and he and some diver buddies, including John Chatterton and Richie Kohler, organized an expedition to the area. Sure enough, just 75 miles off the coast of New Jersey, they found the wreck of a World War II German submarine. When the divers checked Navy records, they found that no wreck had been recorded for that position. Thus began a six-year adventure to identify the U-boat and its crew. The explorers searched the sub for a hull or boat number that would positively identify the wreck. Their dives were fraught with danger as the sub sat at 240 feet of water, requiring 250 pounds of gear, decompression stops on the way up, and scuba tanks full of a mixture of three gases for faster decompression. An expedition on September the 2nd, 1991, ended in tragedy. One of the divers, Stephen Feldman, for reasons unknown, was rendered unconscious and swept away in the current. He was not recovered until several months later, far from the wreck by a commercial fisherman. Months had passed, with little to show but a few artifacts that added no immediate evidence to the wreck's identity. Therefore, in the year of 1992, the Rouses received an invitation to join the Seeker for its upcoming expedition. John Chatterton deemed them perhaps the most formidable diving team in the country and believed they might be the ones to crack this unsolvable case. This was no faint praise coming from a diver as accomplished as John Chatterton. His confidence was echoed by the Rouses themselves. 22-year-old Chrissy boldly declared, I'm going to identify the wreck. I'm going to be the one to do it. This macho and overconfident attitude frequently exhibited by Chris and Chrissy is the main factors that facilitated their rapid advancement in diving, but also what occasionally placed them in risky situations. Prior to diving the Yuhu, the Rouses had zero experience penetrating the confines of U-boats, which is mandatory for safety in technical and deep wrecks, such as the Yuhu. They also had very little experience on deep wrecks in the Northern Atlantic. They had one prior expedition to the Andrea Doria and nothing else notable under their belts. Minor inconveniences seemed to continually plague the Rouses. It was such a standing joke, in fact, that Chris named his diving equipment repair business Black Cloud Scuba. That was run out of the family home. Susan Rouse went as far to state on record, everyone always said we had a black cloud over our heads. Something always went wrong. Chris had even started making his own dive equipment after his excavating company went under during the Reagan recession. On October the 12th, 1992, the seeker arrived 75 miles off New Jersey for the last dive of the season. The day's conditions were unfavorable, characterized by choppy and unpredictable seas. Consequently, numerous team members opted out of the dive due to the challenging circumstances. Notably, Chrissy fell down several times on the way to the water after gearing up. 
it should be noted that both Chris and Chrissy expressed doubts about the dive. Before descending, each of them said, at separate times, that they did not want to do the dive. In each case, the other badgered the other into agreeing to go. There is some speculation that the constant goading of Chrissy Rouse by his father led to his wanting to prove something to him on their final dive. Due to financial constraints, the Rouses chose to make the 240-foot dive on regular air, rather than Trimix, which was available at the time. Despite receiving warnings from others about the risks of using regular air for such a deep dive, Chris and Chrissy proceeded with their choice. When asked for a reason, they stated that they wanted to save money. Just to put things into perspective, at depths below 200 feet, nitrogen narcosis can get so intense for a diver that severe hallucinations are almost inevitable. This can be mitigated mostly by the use of Trimix. The Rouse's intense fixation for the dive and gaining recognition from identifying the wreck is said to have also significantly impacted their judgment. John descended alongside the Rouse's. As cave divers, Chris and Chrissy practiced leaving their decompression bottles attached to the line outside the wreck, as some cavers leave their bottles on the lines. But knowing that they were going to do this, they failed to stage redundant gas on the upline. Even with all their equipment, they could stay at the bottom for only 30 minutes at a time. To make matters worse, the sub was badly damaged. To find anything that identified the sub, John, Chris and Chrissy had to navigate a mass of cables, dislodged equipment and sediment. Chrissy was penetrating the wreck, his last few dives trying to free a piece of canvas with German writing from underneath some debris. At the point, he nearly had it free. He was at the end of his dive plan and narcosis was strong. He pulled the canvas free when a large piece of steel landed on him, pinning his head down. Chrissy struggled but could not free himself. With no options left, he cried out at the top of his lungs for help. Chris, realizing that Chrissy was past his dive time, went in to find him and worked to free him, knowing he had almost no bottom time left. By this time, Chrissy was experiencing narcosis beyond control. Chris eventually managed to free Chrissy, but the effort exhausted their air supplies. Since the wreck was all stirred up and visibility was down to zero, they could not find the way out the way they came in, so they exited further down the ship away from the line and decompression bottles they required for their ascent. Supposingly on the torpedo up, they stopped around 100 feet because they saw the anchor line and had planned to do a short decompression there and head to the surface. At this point, the narcosis that both Chris and Chrissy were encountering is said to have reached a level equivalent to consuming more than 17 martinis. When they ascended, Chrissy tried to breathe off Chrissy's bottle, but got a mouthful of water due to a torn mouthpiece. He panicked and bolted to the surface. Chris quickly followed, both without making the necessary stops to let the nitrogen in their blood safely dissolve. Such an uncontrolled ascent is almost guaranteed to give a diver a severe case of decompression sickness, often called the bends. Once they surfaced, the divers on the boat knew it was over for them. A diver who gets hit with the bends will be wrecked by tremendous pain in every part of their body, as nitrogen bubbles that accumulate in vessels and arteries while diving begin to expand. The reason it's called the bends is that divers will writhe and contort themselves into grotesque shapes when suffering from a severe case. Even a non-fatal case can cause paralysis or brain damage. Many divers who have survived the bends have said they'd rather have drowned. Neither of the Rouses were so lucky. Once the Coast Guard arrived, John argued with the Coast Guard swimmer to take Chrissy's lifeless body on the helicopter with Chrissy. The swimmer refused a number of times until John pointed to Chris Rouse, stating, You've got to take him. We can't risk another basket drop for a dead guy. Are you a medical doctor? Then you can't tell me he's dead for certain. You've got to take him. No! Look, the kid thinks his father's still alive. We've been telling him that so that he keeps on fighting to live. He's got to see his old man on the chopper with him. Otherwise, he'll know he's dead. The swimmer stared at him. 
do you have any idea how risky a basket lift is? We just can't do it for a dead guy. Eventually the swimmer gave in and they took both. It took an extra 20 minutes to load Chris on the helicopter before Chrissy was flown into New York City to a hyperbaric chamber in Bronx Municipal Hospital. At the hospital, they tried to take a blood sample from him. What they got in the vial was foam rather than blood. This caused the blood to clot right in his veins. The situation seemed to be improving slightly when Chrissy began regaining feeling in his limbs and speaking coherently. The hospital then decided to depressurize Chrissy from 160 feet to 60 feet, at which point he lost consciousness and died. Before he died, he told medics he heard the jungle drums and believed a monster was trying to eat him. According to experts, they were essentially dead men the second they hit the surface. And it was pretty amazing that Chrissy even reached the hospital. Survival after coming straight to the surface after 30 plus minutes at 240 feet is very unlikely, even with an on-site recompression chamber. Susan Rouse was notified of the accident by the hospital, but not given details. Chrissy died five minutes after she arrived at the hospital, but she was unable to see him before he died. Ironically, she almost joined her family on that Sandy Hook dive, but decided against taking off from work. On the 31st of August 1997, and about five years after Chris and Chrissy's death, they concluded that the boat they found was U-869, a large ocean submarine for sustained operations far from the home support facilities which sank on the 11th of February 1945. Experts proposed that Trimix, radio communication, a line to the anchor, more caution, staying out of the water on such a rough day, some humidity, and even in-water recompression might have saved them. But it is all really just speculation. The point that the author of Last Dive makes is that what would have saved them more than anything else would have been a communication system between themselves and the service. May they rest in peace. This has been Gripping Horror. I hope to see you in the next one.